Sinfonia in E major, number six. E major is such a joyful key, it's a bright key. It's already the tonality of E major makes me happy. And then compound it with this piece in 9 8 time, and the subject is only one measure built on the first six notes of the E major scale. with a little loop at the end, which I will call the tail, because he's going to develop that tail later in the piece. So if we take the first six measures of the piece, and I play just the soprano and the alto, we actually start the piece with the alto on the tonic. Measure two, the soprano answers on the dominant. And then measure three, the bass comes in, also on the dominant. But for right now, let's just look at what the alto and the soprano do, because these two parts are going to be taking turns in the most beautiful dialogue between the two of them. Leapfrogging and, and taking turns, they actually, this, this just amazed me when I counted how many times the subject came, 31 times. And 12 were soprano and 12 were alto and only 7 for the poor bass. Sorry bass. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to show you now the opening with the alto and the soprano and what he does here. get to decide which of those two voices is going to be louder. That's one of the things Bach is trying to teach us with the inventions in Sinfonias, is how to distinguish between the parts. So they're not the same dynamic level, otherwise we couldn't tell which was what. So let me play it first, bringing the soprano out a little louder. the alto. Very beautiful. Underneath that, the bass. Now, this gets kind of interesting here. This is actually a sequence. Those stepwise thirds and seconds are just bringing us down the E major scale. The left hand, the, actually the bass, played by the left hand. Now, if we take our subject, and I'm going to count the beats. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one. Now, if I take four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Bach is now going to take those beats. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Those are six all together, and he's going to make a sequence out of it its own standalone part. That's one of the reasons that the bass didn't have as many uh, articulations of the subject, because it's going to be spending a fair amount of time with developing sequences. And this is what this bass part sounds like with the six beats. So I'm going to count out loud here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Six times three is 18, but it's really only two measures. Nine times two is 18, and this is a metric shift. So we have right away, measure three, the whole piece starts shifting into sixes instead of nines. Very uh, imaginative. So as I play this now as written, see if you can listen to that division going into sixes. Now, I'm still in 
E major. Going on now to our second line. Let's listen to what he does here. There's going to be another sequence. This time, soprano and alto, sixth, seventh, sixth, seventh, sixth, seventh. You can hear we're clearly moving out of E major. And we've gone modulated to the relative minor. C sharp minor. So putting those parts uh, together, here's our line two. Another sequence. of this edition. I, I adore the satellite view. This is something that I invented. And it's the map of the entire piece. And you get this with your chart. And you can get it at my website, sallychristianmusic.com. Now, I color-coded mine with the three voices just so I could follow where all the subjects come. Uh, yours comes without color. At the end of each of these lines, which I call systems, Bach makes the cadence. So what we have here with this last alto statement of the subject was the cadence to E major. With the soprano at the end of line two, where we just stopped, it's the cadence to the relative minor, C-sharp minor. And each one of these endings, you can see here, it's the subject being articulated and it coincides with the cadence, with an end. So this is so beautifully done, re-engraved, to show the long phrases within the piece. This piece has a combination of the little tiny unit nucleus of the subject over a very long arcing direction, either going ascending or descending. We'll get to that right now. With our third system now, we're getting another sequence. And remember I said the tail of the opening subject? That, no. Those last three notes, if I invert that, just the opposite, it's like a mirror image. That is what he's basing the sequence on. answers. Now the bass takes it away in this fabulous descending line, all built on the inverted tail. Symphonia number 15, using a hidden circle of fifths in the bass as a modulatory tool. So if I put the parts together now, this is going to be a seven measure phrase. Let's listen to this now with all the parts together, starting measure 11. We've modulated to C sharp minor. Another modulation. 
to get there. Bach is giving us his third and final surprise. He's taking the subject and inverting the whole thing. of page one, we've modulated to the dominant. B major. Now we're going to get a, an ascent of five measures, and he's going to have the subject so many times here. Remember, we've got 31 subjects, so listen to where he puts them in this line, starting measure 18, in the bass. in there hiding and it was in the bass at the end of that line as an inverted subject. That <clears throat> to me is so interesting. Back to our satellite view where I am in the piece is midpoint. Systems one, two, three, four. I'm right here and you see all these entries of the subject, soprano, climb, climb, climb. This is that five measure ascent. And at the end of the with the cadence, we get two articulations of the subject in the soprano going up in the original form, in the bass inverted. And that's important because that ushers in the beginning of the second half of the piece and the whole thing is built on inverted subjects. And it's in relative minor key of C-sharp minor. While I still have you here, we're going to have another seven measures, inverted subjects, all going downward, and then our final ascent of five measures all going up. So as you can see, I marked the numbers of measures, seven descending, five ascending. Seven descending, inverted subjects, five ascending. Now look how much of the piece that is. Do you see how splendid this is that you get to see what I call the forest. We have all the trees and this is the forest, the overview, the long vista that's built into this piece. So at this point now we're on page two and we are in the relative minor C sharp minor. All of these subjects are going to go downward. Soprano, bass, now the alto gets to do that six beat sequence. Very interesting. And what went over that is the duet the only time in the piece between the soprano and the bass. Tenth, ninth, tenth, ninth, tenth, ninth, and if it were the tenth, it would be C-sharp. Do you know what Bach does here? This is just when I first learned the piece. This is the part that just blew me away because Bach does, does this. sound quite like that. In context, let's see how he gets to that wonderful B sharp. Remember, this is the seven measure descent, starting measure 23, C sharp minor. up. And 
And I'm going to take the alto alone here. To me, this part is just a bit of magic. In measure 30, climbing up, our subject in its original form. put these just these two lone measures here as a system because it's so pivotal the ladenness harmonic pungency here needed a separate bit of, of uh, defining and then we get here our last wrap up everything is again harmonious we have returned for sure and finally to E major And as 
with our second to the last measure here. That's what's in there. That's the outline. But he's not going to give it straight like that. He's going to give it with these broken fourths. That sounds kind of disturbing too. But in context, it's beautiful. A little bit of playfulness at the end. So here's our last line. range of tempi that this piece will work with. I think I'm going to like this as my ultimate tempo. For learning, I would go half that tempo. That's a wonderful way. In fact, even when I have something learned completely, I always go back and do it at half tempo just to be sure I really understand it up here. And one last little interesting tidbit. Listen to Glenn Gould's. I'm not kidding. And in a way I kind of like that. I, I wouldn't want to do it that way, but it does show the long architecture of this thing. Those huge ascends and descends. So for me, the character of this piece is light and free and airborne. It's playful. I imagine these, with these three voices taking turns 31 times with the subject, playing a game of tag. And I also feel like I get to be free of gravity. And metaphorically, that would mean free of troubles and free of concerns. And I get to let myself go on this piece and fulfill my strongest childhood desire, and that was to be able to fly. Now I really feel I can skim over the surface of, this, with, of life with this piece and be airborne and joyful and playful. You can make up your interpretation and I, I know you're going to love playing this piece. It's just a delightful piece. I've had a great time sharing this with you today. Enjoy practicing your E major symphonia. Thank you. <laughs>